I will talk uh, today, uh, as the slide indicates, about the Vigyapti Patras, texts and representations. <coughs> the Vigyapti Patras, literally letters of request, form a section of a broader genre, the epistle, as developed in medieval India. Some information on the conception of letter writing in Sanskrit during this period is available in the Ananda Lekha Prabandha written by Vinaya Vijaya. It gives a typology of letters uh, where the following seven varieties are distinguished, which you see here. Uh, other works, such as the Patra Kaumudi of Vararuchi or the Lekha Paddati, provide interesting precisions about the formulaic aspect of letters in connection with the circumstances, the nature of the addressee, etc. The Vigyapti Patras represent a literary form specific to the Jains, which is documented in Western India between the 14th and the beginning of the 20th century. It is connected with a specific time of the year and of the religious calendar, namely the crucial turning point of the rainy season and pollution. A good selection of original texts is provided in Muni Dinavijaya's Vigyapti Lekha Sangraha, published as a volume of the Singhi Jain series. But although it has been published a long time ago, this collection has not yet attracted the attention it deserves. There are two varieties of Vigyapti Patras. Uh, in the first variety of letters, which will not be the main focus of this paper, but of which I have studied three samples from the 17th century on another occasion, a junior monk addresses a senior monk. He gives him a kind of report on his activity of the past year and asks forgiveness for his lapses or mistakes. But all this is not done in a plain style. The letters which have come to, to us are embellished literary pieces. They exhibit a mastery of Sanskrit caviar which could not have been in the reach of any ordinary monk and has to be viewed as rare items. The three letters I studied were all written by the same monk one Vinaya Vardhanagani from the Tapagatya, suggesting that there could well have been specialists of this style. He addresses Vijaya Devasuri and Vijaya Singhasuri, two heads of the Tapagatya at the time. As I have tried to show, all the stylistic devices used by the author of the letter are meant to express his respect and affection for his revered teacher. These feelings are expressed in terms of bhakti phraseology and imagery. One of the devices on which I focused is the use of word puzzles. The replies of the word puzzles share a common feature. They are connected with the person of the monk teacher to whom they are addressed in some way. They provide the name of the place where he stays, the name of his father or his mother, laudatory epithets stressing his qualities or his own name. These puzzles are a means to convey the devotion of the monk who writes them to his superior. They show how the devotion expands from the central person of the monk to all the spheres where his splendor irradiates. The rhetoric at work in the letters supports this way of understanding the literary devices. Both the vocabulary and the imagery emphasize the filial bond which unites the author of the letter to his addressee. The emotional tone is further underlined by sentences where the former invites the addressee to think about him persistently and is not far from formulations found in worldly poetry in the context of separation. This variety of letter is usually not illustrated. The second variety of documents to which I turn now are the so-called invitation scrolls. They come from a local Jain community and are addressed to a religious teacher whom they invite for spending the next rainy season. They are on paper, are generally several, several meters long and narrow in width, uh, 20 to 50 centimeters. They have a significant peculiarity. They always contain a series of paintings followed by a text which is generally long and elaborate. My contention is that both the text and the representations should be read together. Both support each other 
and it is that cumulative discourse that creates the meaning. Studying and publishing individual Vigyapti Patras should be a priority task. It is a task connected with the preservation of Jain heritage in India. Those among the Vignapti Patras which are housed in museums or public collections should be made accessible through appropriate publications, but at least they are safe. Such is not the case with other items, which are either in the hands of monks or of pandas in Gujarat and Rajasthan. But in recent years, their lively scenes and colorful paintings seem to have made them attractive with the art dealers who must have got them from unscrupulous individuals. A Vigyapti Patra is always a unicum executed in a careful or even sophisticated manner. Some of them have disappeared from their original spot. The seminal study of Vigyapti Patras was published in 1942 by Dr. Hiranan Shastri, director of archaeology Baroda, Baroda State, a prominent scholar whose contribution to the archaeology and epigraphy of Gujarat is almost unpaired. This important publication, which is difficult to get everywhere, has luckily been scanned and can now be consulted on the web. It describes 24 invitation scrolls from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Unfortunately, the black and white illustrations appended at the end of the book are rather poor, but in some cases, these descriptions could well be the only surviving evidence of a given item. Three years ago, I went to the Jain Bhandar in Chani, near Baroda, with a reasonable hope to be able to examine the text of one of the scrolls described by Hiranan Shastri. It was to see that the object mentioned in the hand list kept in the library was irretrievable, borrowed, or perhaps sold. In recent years, some such scrolls have come up outside India. One of them, about which I will say more later, was acquired by the British Library in 2005. Another one was advertised by Sam Fogg. In 2007, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Australia, acquired such a scroll from Rajasthan, and a German collector acquired one a few years ago. In some cases, only the illustrated part, which comes first as the scroll is unrolled, and is separate from the textile part which follows, has been retained, so that the items are only fragmentary. Thus, a statement such as the Gatipta Patras have been detected in various Jain collections, but not much use of these have been made to this day, so that they lie where and as they were, sounds a little optimistic. I consider important to set a project which will list all the existing Vignetti Patras wherever they are, and give for each of them an identity card providing descriptive information together with the relevant reference to the object in existing publications. I have started such a survey and will go on with it with the hope to make it widely accessible. It is important to connect the objects with the available scholarly sources where one finds a description of the original Sanskrit text. The present short paper, based on the examination of a few items, is only a beginning. Oops, sorry. Um, both the textual and the iconographic sections of a Vigyapti Patra are highly formalized. This is what we are going to see now. Although there is, to my knowledge, no manual where guiding principles for the organization of the text of the scroll would be laid down, there are recurring principles and patterns which show that there was a well-established tradition in the field. <coughs> of course, it does not mean that the texts are identical. As a rule, the text is divided into two sections which are clearly distinct from each other <coughs> in appearance. The first one is informal or ordinary Jain Devanagari of Western India, and the second one in cursive script typical of the administrative documents from Rajasthan and Gujarat. Language and style are also markedly different. The formal part, which is normally by far the longer, uses Sanskrit and Prakrit, but also vernaculars, whereas the cursive one resorts to the original language in use. <coughs> 